Closed captioning of this program is made possible by the Fireman's Fund Foundation. The, Will uh, the new uh, Senate uh, maps drawn by the Citizens the Redistricting Commission be used in the upcoming June and November elections? More than a thousand city workers received pink slips as Oakland prepares to lose redevelopment funds. Ross Mir Karimi, San Francisco's new sheriff, faces three misdemeanor charges related to domestic violence. Also, a preview of the documentary, The Memory Be Green, an intimate look at the personal and creative journey behind Ghost Light. The new play tells the story of the loss of Jonathan Moscone's father, San Francisco Mayor George Moscone. I lost my dad when my back was turned. I didn't even see him die. It's obviously a piece of me that hasn't been put together. Coming up next. I'm Belva Davis and welcome to This Week in Northern California. Joining me tonight on our news panel are Lisa Vorderbruggen, Contra Costa Times political and government reporter, Josh Richmond, Bay Area News Group's politics reporter, Barbara Taylor, KCBS radio reporter. Barbara Taylor, there have been so many breaking elements in the story about the new sheriff, Ross Mirkarimi. What's the, the latest? Well, I think I would sum it up by saying it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, that line from A Tale of Two Cities, Charles Dickens, because that's really what Ross Mercurimi's life has been like this past week. It started out on Sunday when, after serving seven years on the Board of Supervisors, he was sworn in as the city's new sheriff. He called it the best day of his life. And now, just five days later, he has been charged by the city's uh, district attorney with three misdemeanor counts related to allegations of domestic violence. Domestic violence battery, child endangerment, and dissuading a witness. All of this stems from a fight that he had with his wife on New Year's Eve. Now, suddenly, his political career is on life support. He still says he will not step aside. He says he will prove his innocence. His wife stood beside him just a couple of hours ago, literally, at City Hall, also denying the charges. She says they are unbelievable and completely wrong. Now, this I don't think we've seen even in this city before. Um, is there evidence yet that you think the district attorney is holding that would cause him to go ahead and, and file these charges against him? Well, uh, two weeks ago, when just about two weeks ago when, when this happened, uh, Lopez contacted a neighbor. And that's his wife. That's his, his wife, and Mrs. Mercury. We contacted a neighbor, Ivory Madison, and asked her to videotape a bruise on her arm. She told the neighbor allegedly that she had, that he had grabbed her very harshly during this New Year's Eve fight. Um, apparently, there were also a series of text messages that went back and forth between the neighbor and Mercury's wife. She, the the um, the neighbor who is an attorney did not release this information, but it was ultimately subpoenaed by police. And just on the surface, unless there's, one would assume that there is something particularly in those text messages that would lead to the filing of these charges because a videotape of a bruise on an arm seems to be just a bit flimsy when you're talking about charges this serious. So one would assume that there is other evidence that has not come out uh, that that will come to the forefront. He's due to be arraigned next Tuesday. And from this point, we are really unfolding yet another chapter where now the mayor has to decide if he wants to proceed 
with a misconduct charge against him, suspend him, which would send the whole case to the at the city's ethics commission for a hearing, then on to the board of supervisors. The board of supervisors, with nine votes, could remove him from office. I think it's a little premature to be talking about that, but those are the various things that could happen to Ross Mercurimi, who was really flying high just weeks ago. And this, this is really takes on a different dimension because he's not only an elected officer, but he's a peace officer as well. And, and his job requires that. I mean, if convicted of a misdemeanor, he'd be the only sheriff in the state who can't carry a gun and who's going to counseling every week. What, what does that sort of add to this in terms of the pressure on him? I think it adds a lot. And I think the, the other thing that you were alluding to is you know, when you talk about domestic violence, this is something that has been very much at the forefront in the district attorney's office, in the police department, and in the sheriff's department, which has classes on domestic violence. After this happened, um, Mercurimi basically brushed it off, saying it was a private family matter. That consequently enraged groups that speak out on behalf of victims of domestic violence. They then came together on Thursday, held a press conference at the steps of City Hall, denounced him, insisted that he step aside until he's either exonerated or the, the charges are upheld, and said, you know, this isn't a family matter. It isn't a private matter. We've spent years trying to get neighbors, friends, people who observe this kind of thing happening to step forward, and this is a major setback in our attempt to really enlighten the community about the seriousness of domestic violence. Now he has said that he won't step down if he gets or step aside or step if, aside while the investigation ensues. Is there a sense that he'll be pressured to do that rather than going through this entire process that you just described of being sort of shipped out? Well once again I think that that's something that's going to unfold over the next couple of weeks, just depending on the kind of media coverage, what other things are leaked out, and it seems pretty clear that there have been leaks of mm. some sort coming out of the district attorney's office. Uh, Mark Remy has also said he feels that that's political, politically motivated. I'm not sure that was such a good approach on something like this, but um, I, I think it could go a number of ways, that he could dodge a bullet, hang in there, hope that the mayor does not uh, file misconduct charges against him and maybe survive this. Again, I think it's going to depend a bit on what evidence Was comes up. Was there a up. restraining order issued against him? Has there been one? As part of the filing of these charges, the district attorney also uh, got a restraining order to keep him from being around his wife. And a certain irony of this, since they, they made a statement together, very much acting as, as the loving couple after the charges were filed. But what I'm told is that this is a pretty common thing that, it, that occurs, and that probably uh, next week they will go back to the court and modify that restraining order so that he can go back to the home and stay with his wife while this uh, case play, runs its course. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't think anyone could have guessed that the course of life that's happened for Ross Mirkarimi would have taken the, the turns that have had. So uh, more developments along the way. And that's why they call it Friday the 13th. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's certainly Friday the 13th for a lot of people in Oakland oh, yes. ex expecting to get uh, slips that say they may not have a job in the future. A lot of uh, notices, but hopefully not as many uh, Firing. Yeah, the pink slips are going out to, to about 1,500 uh, Oakland City employees uh, as, as the city approaches a February 1st deadline to basically dissolve its redevelopment agency. Ultimately, uh, only fewer than 200 are actually going to lose their jobs, but the city council is trying to, to maintain as much flexibility as it can and give as much notice as it can so that it can figure out where these positions are going to have to be cut. The redevelopment funds are so part and parcel of the city budget. They, they extend into so many different departments that this, this is going to impact way beyond just the Community and Economic Development Agency. There, there are 17 police officers who are, whose salaries are paid for uh, by, by these funds. Their contract protects them from layoff, so other people will have to be laid off in their place somewhere else in the city. There are people in the uh, city administrators and city attorney's office and so on and so forth. So I, th really no part of the city is likely to remain completely untouched by this. And this, this is you know, what has come of this budget deal that was struck last year where yeah, the legislature... There, uh, there are about 400 uh, 
similar cities. Oh yeah, across the, this why, is going to play out Oakland all over the so, state. So rapidly? Well, o Oakland, uh, perhaps the the money is more deeply embedded in in Oakland's infrastructure than in some other places. But all cities, Los Angeles is 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 also moving to to shut down its redevelopment agency and grapple with the loss of funds down there. Um, we had two state senators today introduce a bill uh, um, th that would delay this effective date from February 1st to April 15th to give cities a little bit more time to grapple with this. But nobody's actually saying that, that the money will be kept. The money is going away under this deal that was struck with the legislature and the governor last year. And basically the cities have sort of to some extent, you know, are now reaping what they've sown. They went to court to try to stop this deal, this budget deal uh, and, and the seizing of these redevelopment funds. And um, the original deal had a provision that would allow these agencies to continue to exist if they sort of tithed some of their money back to the state. Um, the redevelopment agencies in the cities went for broke. They tried to challenge the whole thing, and the only part that got thrown out was that deal. So now they have no option at all but to shut, shut down. It kind of came back and bit them in the butt. You know, Josh, one of the things I don't understand about this is why was Oakland using redevelopment funds for things like hiring police officers? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is not the intention of this money. Not not the original intention of this money, but I think the the larger and and to some extent more economically strapped and and blighted city that that you get, the more likely it is that they're going to take money from wherever they can find it to plug whatever holes they have. And I think over the decades, that's what's come to pass in Oakland. It, it's frankly not that unusual. Out mm -hmm. in Contra Costa County, their redevelopment agencies have also used, you know, for police officers, code enforcement officers, uh, benefits to help address crime and blight mm -hmm. in particular areas. And that money was available. And they, the as we've seen, all these local governments have lost so much cash. You'll, you'll never see a city council say no to money like that. No. Uh, but now they're going to have to go there, and, and, and you can probably explain this better than I can, Lisa, about the, the amazing hoops they're going to have to jump through in order to, to, to give up this money in a way that is in compliance with the scheme devised by the right. legislature. Yeah, the bureaucracy summer. that's been established for dissolving these districts is almost worse than the bureaucracy <laughs> that exists to have free development agencies. It's going to be quite a uh, an unwinding of the onion to try to... Uh, to see the end of this, and, and I suspect there will be some delay, um, but probably not a lot. And these, Don't these agencies have large debts that they also owe and that, other obligations. Th 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 those will be tied up neatly. The, the money is not simply going to disappear from those things. It's merely that the, the cities can't bank on this money going right. forward. And all the to assets pay all of a positions. redevelopment agency will be sold to pay off the debts. So any properties, parcels, buildings, anything that the redevelopment agency has been holding will be sold in order to pay off. And many of them have considerable debt. And, and the legislature is completely in the driver's seat. The, you yes. know, because of this the lawsuit, uh, the, yeah. the cities really have nothing more to say about it. Uh, Senate President Pro Tem Steinberg this week has sort of said he's not closing the door on a postponement, but as John Myers from KQED Radio put it, he's not exactly jumping to stop the door from closing either. So, and bottom line, we have to talk about what this money was used for. It was used for building low. It, it's been used housing. for low, for redeveloping blighted uh, areas, low-income housing, business development, stuff like that. Um, but as Lisa said, in the t in the case of police officers, to police the such areas, and in the case of uh, other departments, to, to provide services to those areas. So. Final word, yes. Mayor, Mayor Kwan, does she have anything to say in all of this other than sending out the notices? Uh, like I said, she and the city council now have in uh, you know, the next 10 days or so to try to grapple with how to pull this off, but really they, they can't stop it. Mm -hmm. Well, Lisa Vorderburden, what is going to happen about an election for state senators? I mean, we seem to have a lot of confusion at the court level, uh, up and down the line as to whether anybody's been is going to be allowed to to, uh, to 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 say what circumstances where the lines will be for the Senate district well if your crystal ball is functioning I'm sure the uh, Republican Party would love to have a, a window into that because they everyone is asking that question and I and I do say everyone qualified is mostly political junkies because I don't know how many folks out in the general public really care about redistricting but um, by way of background this the Supreme Court is has under consideration as we speak um, and a, a challenge by the Republican Party to suspend the state Senate maps that were drawn by the redistricting commission. 
in light of their referendum that they have submitted that would put it on the ballot um, for up or down vote in, in November. And the Republicans are saying, look, the voters are going to have their say, but in the interim, we got to ditch these maps um, and let the voters speak first before we implement all these line changes. But didn't the voters already have their say? Isn't that why this ended up with a commission in the hands of a commission in the first place? Voters decided they wanted a commission to draw up the district boundaries to, and take it out of the hands of the politicians. And ironically, it's the politicians who who want it to be turned over now to judges because they think they're going to get a different outcome. The Republicans are concerned that the Democrats will gain a two-thirds majority in the Senate, which would allow them to approve um, taxing and budget proposals, you know, without their say. But that's a purely political concern. And the fact Absolutely. is they, they essentially refuse to engage the Citizens Redistricting Commission and sort of make their concerns known during the process. They practically boycotted it while the Democrats exerted what influence they were allowed to exert. And now, you know, they essentially the Republicans came with a knife to a gunfight, and now they're complaining that they right. got shot. Uh, I'm not yeah. sure, you know, what kind of legal and, recourse that, and, that And the independent analysts have concluded that the maps, for the most part, there may be a few little tweaks, have come out in the way in which we live. Right. We, we live in areas that are predominantly Republican, predominantly Democrat. They drew the lines. Yeah, you could make a few changes here and there. But, you know, the, the Public Policy Institute of California, their expert has said, look, in fact, the way the lines are, new lines are drawn, the Re Republicans could actually do pretty well in 2014 because of the way, because only half of the 40 seats are up mm -hmm. um, every two years. Are so, they substantially different? I mean, I, I've read a lot of stories about, oh, these two different assembly members are going to have to run against each other for the same seat, or suddenly there's overlap. Is there just... Yes, they are substantially different than they used to be. And what happens is, just because you have a lot of candidates and incumbents who are preparing to run, if the maps are suspended, then they may or may not live in the district for which they've actually filed or you know raised money to go. And then you get an uncertainty about, and they're four-year terms. So you run now and then the voters approve the change. You go back to some other maps and then they're no longer living in the district in which they, I mean, it creates a lot of chaos and, and confusion. And we'll see what the court decides to do because the justices have um, a number of options on the table. They could they could go back to the existing maps. They could take the new maps. They could Republicans have offered a map. I think the Democrats have thrown up a map. I mean, we could have any map. And we'll is there a lawsuit filed by yes, the over Re representation but, over? Uh, well, voter the Republicans rights? have filed a federal court challenge to the congressional maps. So that is a separate federal lawsuit that's awaiting. And we're also waiting federal approval on the Voting Rights Act issues for some of the, d the maps in the areas which have had minority voting problems in the past. So we still have that pending as well. So there are a number of fronts that could change these maps. But in the meantime, the election is going to be in June. Mm -hmm. And then we have another one in November. And people have to run based on something. And what we end up with, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe your crystal ball might be as good as anyone's. Now, the courts are waiting to find out when they'll have a count of the petitions that the Republicans have filed. Correct. To <laughs> yeah, February to stop the 24 whole thing. is the 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 uh, they did a sample count and the, it didn't come up with a high enough percentage for the referendum to qualify. So now they have to go back and do a full count and every county count all the signatures to see whether they get to that magic, you know, 500 plus thousand registered voters that are valid. And mm -hmm. I would think that uh, there's a drop dead date that's got to be coming up mm -hmm. fairly soon for this because if there's an election in June, you can't wait until June to do it. I mean, all the ballots have to be prepared and a lot of Correct. work has to be done. Yeah. There, you know, every election office in the county is preparing their GIS maps with all the districts and the boundaries. And, you know, if you live on 123 Main Street, what district are you in? Depends on ballots you get. So there's a lot of, you know, paperwork involved. Well, in Lisa, this. we will just assume that someone will decide and people will be able to <laughs> you vote will, this you year. Will, we, we will survive <laughs> yeah. this. We always have. So. <laughs> okay, thank you.